So for some of you, this is your first time here, and so I don't want to assume that you have a lot of knowledge of what we've discussed at school committee and what we've discussed at the previous forum. So I'll kind of start at the beginning. And I'd like to share with you first the format for tonight. We're here for 90 minutes. I would like to own the first 15 uh, minutes, possibly 20, as I share with you what we've done to this point. And then the rest of the time is yours. Uh, until 8.30, you have my undivided attention. And this is one of those public forum meetings where uh, you can respond to each other. You can talk to each other. It doesn't have to be centered on, on me. I'm here to listen. I would like to recognize Stephanie Pick, our school committee vice chair, who is here to also listen to your thoughts and ideas. And if she feels so inclined, she'll share some thoughts. But for the most part, I think she'll just be listening to hear what you have to say. Because this is a community forum, it's open for you to speak. Uh, there's no time limit. Uh, I you know, hope that we'll just have a civil discussion and people be respectful of the time. I know that there are some people here that have spoken on this issue passionately and certainly have a right to speak passionately once again. But for the purposes of starting the forum, I would hope that we'd get to hear the voices of people who are here for the first time and kind of start there and then uh, move along from there. So to start from the very beginning, the issue of moving the high school start time um, from 7.30 to 8, 8.30 or later has been discussed for, depends who you talk to, six years, seven years, nine years, has been discussed for a very long time and there has been no change. It's not because people are convinced of the sleep study and the sleep research it says that adolescents need more sleep and the circadian rhythms and the times that they should be asleep. As far as I've heard, nobody argues with their research at all. We buy it, we think it's valid research and take it as, as uh, good solid reasoning. What's standing in our way, uh, it seems, is a way to move the high school start time in a way that's cost effective and not disruptive to other families in the city, and also if it's something that the high school really wants. So that's where I come in last August when I first heard about this issue, and there is a very committed group of community members, some parents, uh, some not, but very committed group of community members who feel that the high school should start later than 7.30. 8 o'clock, 8.30, some will say as late as 9 o'clock. However, this proposal in my time here has not come to me or to the school committee from the high school. It hasn't come from the students, hasn't come from the teachers, hasn't come from the high school administration. Uh, so I am hesitant to make a change when it's not a recommendation coming from our system. However, I think a small group of committed citizens making a change is an important part of the democratic, democratic process. And so I want to listen to these ideas and I asked the school committee if I could hold a series of public forums, listen to ideas from community members, and bring to them in September three proposals uh, and let them have a decision, let them make a decision on if they want to change the start time or not. So the way I see it in September of this year, I will take to the school committee three proposals for moving the high school start time um, to eight o'clock or later and they will have a fourth choice, which is to leave it just the way it is, okay? After that decision, if they choose to make any change, then the following September, September of 2013, it would be put into place. That would give us a year to build it into the budget if there is budgetary impact, and we would make the plans, change the schedule, do all the communication we needed to do, uh, and have it ready to go the following year. So far, at the first forum, uh, I brought two ideas forward, and I'm just gonna give you a summary of it. One idea is to move the high school start time from 7.30 to eight o'clock and change no other school. So if we, if we just enlisted new buses, hired new bus routes, you know, uh, to move the high school kids to eight o'clock, it would cost approximately $187,000 annually to make that change. That's proposal number one. Proposal number two is relatively no cost proposal 
that would move the high school later and move the elementary and the middle schools as well. And I've cautioned uh, people about that idea. And remember, not only has the high school not asked to have their, high, their start time changed, the middle school, families, parents, teachers, and administration, have not asked to have their school day changed. In addition, the elementary schools, students, parents, teachers, and administration, are not asking us to change their start time. So the second proposal, which keeps our three-tiered busing system, so does not increase our costs for the most part, but changes every level of school start time in the district. And that's what brought us to our first forum when a community member and, and group of community members brought forward a third option that they believed would meet the needs of the high school kids starting later and believe that also it would be a cost savings. It would be a savings of the number that was thrown around was maybe thirty to forty thousand um, dollars. I had taken a look at the plan prior to that meeting and I felt that it fell apart in so many ways that I hadn't vetted it out. Um, my mistake. The group at the forum saw, thought that wasn't fair and wanted me to go back and do my homework which is exactly what we did and I asked my team to help me out. Has this been passed out? Does everybody have a copy of this? Okay. <clears throat> so this was proposal number three from the last forum and I just wanna, there's a lot of information here, I'm not gonna read it to you, uh, but I would like to show you a few highlights. What this proposal number three and we refer to as the hub busing system would mean is that the high school kids and elementary school kids would be picked up in the same bus route and then taken to the elementary schools. The elementary school kids, of course, would be dropped off and go to school. The high school kids would wait at the elementary school until the second round of buses came and picked them up and took them to the high school. You can see that this starts with the school start times in the middle column there and importantly the drop off at school, when the buses drop them off. And of course in the third column, what's the earliest that the bus routes start? So you can see that the high school kids are the earliest getting picked up as early as 6.35 a.m. But of course not all of them get picked up at 6.35 a.m., just those at the beginning of the route. And in the hub busing proposal, it would be changed so that the elementary schools would now start at 8.10 the high school would start at 8.20, and the middle school would start at 8.50. All right? That would mean that the earliest bus route would now be 7.15 a.m. for the f people who are picked up first in the route, and that would be the same for elementary and high school kids. So for the high school, that means 40 minutes more time in the morning before they have to catch the bus. For the elementary kids, it's 40 minutes earlier that they have to catch the bus. And JFK would be at 810. According to that proposal, it looked like we could fill the buses and even have some overfill the buses and in some cases even have kids standing on the bus, which we're not able to do. Now I know there's a lot of controversy around the bus laws. Right? I have to follow the laws. We can like them or not like them, but I have to follow them. And so we have to have a seat for every kid with a bus pass who buys a bus pass or who receives a bus pass for free because of their financial status. We can't overbook the buses in the event that all the kids take the bus on one day and there are some kids standing in the aisle. That's illegal. We can't do that. So you'll see the description of in proposal number three of how the buses would run in the morning and in the afternoon if you flip over to the back side of the first page the cost in busing for right now it costs us uh, $745,000 to run the buses if we were to use this new model it would be an increase in cost of 113000 which in fairness is cheaper than the other proposal of $187,000 to move just the high school but it's still comes with a cost. There are some uh, 
other explanations of the volume, the need for buses, how many people we can put on a bus legally, and of course then some laws and regulations uh, backing up what I'm saying about uh, how we cannot overbook the buses. On the third page, or the front of the front face of the second page, you'll see where it says drawbacks to proposal three, and there are some highlights there. They continue on the back side of that page. And then the last sheet is a letter from our athletic director, uh, which explains his need for buses for the athletes after school because some of our athletic teams go to JFK for their games and competitions. And also uh, some of our teams practice at Smith College for indoor track, but they don't take a bus over there, they walk over there. So that is how we were able to cost out and look at the fine details of the proposal number three. Uh, I open it up for discussion with the reminder that when I, what I'm doing here is having a listening session with the community to see if someone can come up with a better proposal than I have come up with that I can take to the school committee because I will take to them four options. One, moving the high school to eight o'clock at a cost, and, and only the high school at a cost of $187,000. Two, keeping the three-tier busing system and moving all the start times for the elementary and the middle school. A third one that you will help me come up with and propose, and the fourth option to do nothing at all and leave it as is. All right, with that, I'd like to open up the discussion, hear your thoughts, questions, and comments, and remember, it doesn't have to be just to me. If someone else wants to respond to a comment that somebody makes, Please feel free. I will, do we have a microphone that we can use? And I will use my trusted assistant and director of academic effectiveness to help facilitate getting the microphone to people so we can hear each other. <laughs> is it on? Yeah, it is. I'm a senior citizen who uses the JFK pool exclusively for water aerobics. The proposal that's number three would give the rec department full hour in the mornings for water aerobics, not the 40 minutes they're restricted to. We can, their proposal, they can push, could put the pool open later in the evening, especially in the winter time when the high school swim team is done using it. They're committed to work with the school department because everybody should realize that that pool and the gym and the tennis courts, a lot of the funding comes from users. That was the way it was voted in 1993. We're getting quite a bargain. It's a used facility. I have heard from some of the elementary parents, wouldn't it be nice if I could get the kids to school for eight o'clock so I can get to work instead of having to wait nine o'clock? But there's one other thing that a lot of people should realize. If you have a later start time on the bus routes, you're going to have the DPW a little extra time in case if you have an overnight snowfall that shuts down like one or two in the morning to get the roads passable so, Brian, you don't have to even have a 90 minute delay which nicely shuts the aquatic center down in the morning, by the way. So you've got, you've got a, a, a gain there. Right now, as a senior citizen, 
I'm pretty well favoring proposal, num <coughs> proposal number three. The rec department can work very nicely in rearranging their programs even later swim time in the evening to compensate for the fact that the high school swim team probably would be in the pool till 5.30 at night. The meets probably would start an hour later. Um, I believe starting this fall, the winter water aerobics may not be on Tuesday nights owing to the fact that probably all the swim meets will be on Tuesday nights. They're willing to change. So I've got to say, thank you. But please, by June or September, we need a decision out of the school board one way or the other. Talking about bus plans, there was a plan that we discussed that I would like your administration to look at. Mm -hmm. Would not change the junior high school or elementary school times at all. Mm -hmm. The um, high school students would ride the buses um, that would go to JFK. So if they're in walking distance of the high school, it would not affect them. Mm -hmm. They would go t from the JFK bus routes that are existing now. Mm -hmm. They would go on the same bus. And again, busing is a, is a privilege. And if there was high school students that people thought were going to bully sixth graders or seventh graders, we could deal with that. My experience in the high school that the kids are very, very nice. And especially early in the morning, they have their iPods on. They're very docile. <laughs> and in fact, <laughs> the, the Key Club students have been going to Jackson Street, mm -hmm. and they want us there. So I mean, yeah. th these are all the kids in the same community. So if they would go to um, JFK. JFK would start at the typical time. You'd have two, right now, JFK buses sit there. So you'd have p potentially two or three buses from JFK. Those kids would enter just like at Port Authority if you're used to New York or different places where it would be the first two lead buses. Mm -hmm. All those kids that were going to the high school would get on the two lead buses or three lead buses, be dropped off at the high school, which is, I assume, like eight minutes to do. Mm -hmm. And so that way, the high school can start later. Right now, the high school pickup buses is not meeting the kids' needs. I think there's about mm -hmm. 50 or 60 kids that take the buses on the way home. If mm -hmm. the kids stay for sports, they, they can't take the bus. If kids need after school help, they can't take the bus. And I'm thinking this proposal, you'd have a four o'clock bus that would mm -hmm. then pick up kids. Mm -hmm. So it'd be nice if your administration could look at that to see if it's possible. Sounds like an idea that's similar to this one yet different because it's the one hub of JFK and it only moves the high school, this idea. Um, if you wouldn't mind sketching that out a little bit um, in detail so that I could cost it out and take a look at it, I'd be very happy to do that. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> well, the mic is being used because this is being filmed so that it can be played again on cable. It's If you so choose to, would you state your name uh, so that people know uh, who you are for radio uh, and television? Okay, uh, uh, my, I'm Rebecca Goggins. I have a uh, elementary school, fourth grader, and a middle school, sixth grader right now. I actually was just curious because we didn't outline the second option with the high school starting later and the other mm -hmm. school starting times changing what those changes would be. Mm -hmm. I believe that the change is that the middle school would start even yeah. earlier. But um, I, it can, I didn't know what those were and was wondering if you could outline Let me share that with you. That was option two. And that was, uh, and by the way, uh, we're going to put a survey out of that tomorrow or next week. Next week, a survey um, with a summary of the options to just get a feel of uh, where the community is. But um, briefly, option two, which keeps the three-tiered busing system, is at relatively no cost, but changes all the building start times. The high school would start at 8.30, end at 3.00. JFK would start at 7.45 a.m. and at 2.20, and the elementary schools would begin at 9.20 and end at 
if you want my opinion on that, actually, one of the reasons I'm here is that I do have a sixth grader and I have noticed a massive change in her sleeping habits now that she's 11. And she's actually one of the younger sixth graders because she doesn't have a birthday until August. Um, the idea of starting middle school even earlier would be of a concern to us because she is having a hard enough time getting up now to get ready mm -hmm. to sc for school. And she doesn't even take the bus now. I drive her to school. Mm -hmm. So I'm getting her to school at like 7.45. Mm -hmm. And it's, she's very interested in what's happening here today because mm -hmm. she is concerned about how she's not getting enough sleep and she's not able to fall asleep. So I, I'm interested in the proposal that will allow the high school to start later and the junior high to start later because there is definitely a change in her as a preteen and I'm expecting the same for my you know rising fourth grader so I just want to state that now okay thanks thank you <laughs> we had a wireless mic at the last uh, forum. <laughs> My name is Suzanne Strauss, and I am a parent of uh, high school and middle schoolers. My children went to the Jackson Street School, and I teach at Northampton High School. Um, I probably may, I may be the only person over 16 or 17 in this room that has actually taken the bus, and I've had the privilege of take, I've taken the bus on a couple of occasions, the high school bus. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed on the route that I've taken is that there's about 10 kids on the bus, or maybe 12, and the bus leaves where we live at about 20 minutes of 7 and arrives at the high school at approximately 7 o'clock. And so high school starts at 7.25. Mm -hmm. So there's this big gap right there that's sort of problematic. The other thing is, is um, we, my class is doing a project with the Jackson Street School students, and so we have a relationship with fourth graders in Ms. Ebitz's class. And one of the things that we do is we take a bus to Emily Dickinson's house. We study about five different days studying Emily Dickinson. And one of the things that's really interesting is how well the students get along on the bus. And so I don't know, I know that this was a proposal that was brought up in the past mm -hmm. that elementary school kids and high school kids could potentially take the bus together. Mm -hmm. And I think it would be a great idea. Mm -hmm. The, the uh, elementary school kids really look up to the high school kids. The high school kids really respond to that. But generally speaking, there's no activity at all from high school kids on the bus mm -hmm. at 7, whatever it is, 6.40 in the morning. It just doesn't happen. The other thing that I just did want to mention, I know there's been lots of things. I am for the late start time. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's a good idea because I teach this. I, right now, I teach a writing section at 7.30, mm -hmm. and I teach a writing section at 12.30. Some of my students are in both of those classes or sitting in this room. There is a marked difference between what you see in terms of people's energy between the morning, which is very subdued, and the afternoon, which is much more lively. And I think there are definitely students who are early morning people. They thrive that way. There's no question about it. And, but I think the majority of students, when we have standardized testing, when we have anything, nothing is starting before 8 o'clock. And ideally, when we have visitors come to the school, when there's anything, if it can start at 9, we start things at 9. And I think it's just because students are just doing better. that They're in. They're, they've geared up. Um, I think it's really complicated, and I, um, you know, I feel like the the um, research shows most students would benefit at the high school level, and perhaps even at the middle school level. But I don't think really a half an hour is probably enough time to make a big fuss. I think you need to go. I saw something we got in school today, but I don't have it with me. About 50 minutes. I think then you're sort of, sort of starting to approach something that actually is meaningful. But if we could shorten the gap on the bus 
And then if we could think about, you know, what are we doing this for? Then I think the question becomes, okay, there's a million ways to slice and dice the money and figure out the buses. I mean, people have talked about, I know Steve Harrell and um, Renee have put through a proposal about trying to uh, buy buses and save money that way. Mm -hmm. You know, we live in a very progressive town and maybe we could get some kind of internet carpool thing. I mean, people are doing all kinds of creative things where people could, you know, t have Cory checks. Or, I mean, I would be happy for my kids. I pro my kids will, probably won't because I'll have two kids in the high school next year. It's too expensive. I probably won't put them on the bus next year. Mm -hmm. And I think Renee makes an excellent point, which is in the afternoon, the buses are almost empty from the high school because people are doing activities and you can't do it. So there's a, there's a gap there. So anyway, um, the other th final thing thought that I wanted to say was there are a lot of times, there's not a lot of teachers who show up to this from the high school and I think sometimes people question why that is. And, I, and my sense of it is this, there is, it's a very controversial issue and it gets people feeling kind of emotional. And I think we all, the high school faculty wants to do what's best for kids. But unfortunately, the finances do not always allow that. And so I don't want to be pitted against some teacher who I respect as a professional to say that they're wrong or I'm wrong or whatever. And so I think that's why you don't see a lot of teachers here. And that's, I think it's something worth mentioning. And I think you would find a great variety in what teachers would want too. But I, I, I know that I'm speaking for myself. I think there's a lot of other teachers who actually believe in a later start time, but they might not talk about it. And there might be some teachers who aren't, don't believe in a later start time, and they also wouldn't talk about it for the same reason. It feels politically kind of, you know, like, oh, I don't want to offend anybody. So I think that should be brought to light. While we're waiting to move the microphone to our next speaker, I want to make a comment about the buses dropping the kids off early uh, before the start time. And it's uh, federally mandated that the students, the buses have to arrive at least 15 minutes early for the breakfast program. So, it, you know, from what you said, they're arriving 25 minutes early on that day or on those days. And we have to have the routes uh, coordinated as such so that they're never. They never have less than 15 minutes, and they have to account for traffic and bad weather, too. But I just wanted to make that point. Thank you very much. Um, we have a speaker with the microphone, uh, and my, then we'll go. Hi. My name is Andy Zimbalist. I live in Ward 2, and I have mm -hmm. two children who will be uh, going into the ninth grade next year. Mm -hmm. First of all, I'd like to thank you for your careful consideration of Proposal 3. I can't say that I understand everything that's in your response, but I appreciate that you've looked at it carefully, and, and also your apparent openness to consider other, other options. I, I wonder if you know if Jim Miller has tried to approach Smith College about, I know there's already some athletic use of the Smith facilities, but perhaps even greater use. For instance, one of the things that Smith, I think, has in its budget plan for either this coming year or the year after is to put lights on the new lacrosse field and, and field hockey field, mm -hmm. uh, which will make it possible for the Smith team to both practice and play on it um, later, later in the afternoon or into the evening. Uh, which might open up sometimes in the mid-afternoon uh, for the high school. Uh, and I also wonder whether it might be possible to, to approach Smith about using some of their vans. They have, I don't know the number, but they probably have a dozen or so vans that are used to transport Smith students that seem not to be uh, used at full capacity. So just in general, it seems like a full exploration of, of what those possibilities might be w would be desirable. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Howard, you had, had your hand up. Yeah, when you said the 15 minutes, my recollection from the, oh, I'm sorry, but my recollection from the uh, handout we got two years ago, um, the PowerPoint thing, which had the, um, the anchor time at the elementary schools just 10 minutes before school started. Mm -hmm. So if 15 minutes is the rule, either my recollection is wrong or we're All right, not note, following the rule. The note I was just <laughs> handed said it was federally mandated 15 minutes early. We can look that up to verify We'll see it. if we're actually doing yeah. it. Yeah. Of course. I'm sorry, Mark? Ten. He says 10 minutes well, early the bus for is teachers for students. So I'll check that handout. Okay. Thank you.
Hello, um, I'm a junior at Northampton High School now, and I would just like to assert that I am against a later start time. I'm for keeping things the way they are now. And I do recognize like um, teen sleep rhythms. Last Thursday night, I was up till 1.30 in the morning because I couldn't fall asleep the night before my AP US exam. That happens sometimes, but I think something like when people sleep, like I was talking to my friends today, we went out for lunch, we were talking about like, if we go to school later, we're gonna stay up later at night. It's just, I think that's ine inevitable of changing the start time. And that for all the like thought and effort and changes that this would produce, I don't think the benefits would, the, the benefits would not outweigh like the damaging effects and the uh, consequences that are unintended from changing the school start time. And I think that on an issue like this, student opinion and teacher opinion should have greater weight than research. I know, like, I recognize that research and science are all very important. I'm not opposing that, but I think on an issue like this that students and teachers should really be taken into consideration. Thank you. I'm glad you said science is very important because your science teacher is here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen Kaur. I have a seventh and eighth grader. And I, my seventh grader was gonna come with me tonight, but she's fast asleep. Um, my kids' rhythms are so far off right now because they're not getting enough sleep at night that it's routine that one of them is asleep at some time in the early evening or late afternoon and then wakes up later and can't go to sleep. So we're a mess. Um, it's affecting my sleep and work life as well as my kids because I have to get up so early to make sure that they are on the bus on time. Just a couple of other options that I was thinking of were if you, if you totally flip the schedules and switch the high school and elementary school, um, I, I've heard that we can't do that because the elementary school students will be out in the dark, but most elementary school students are out there with a parent, and it's the high school students that are out there at 6.15 in the morning alone, and I think that's a little scarier. And the other thing I was thinking is that since um, only 50 or so kids are taking the bus home from high school, why don't we just cut that extra cost in half and only have bus service in the morning for high school? And, let those 50 kids will find a way to get home. So. Hi, my name is Mitch Hartley. Um, I have a couple of quick questions because I'm sort of new to this and it seems mm -hmm. like there's a lot of information that comes to bear on this, but isn't, you know, we don't have it all laid out in front of us, but right. what is the sort of annual school budget in terms of you know, the total budget, maybe teacher salaries, how much money are, we, money are we talking about? $28 million. Okay, $28 million. So I guess as someone who's fairly new to this, and I don't know how much this is being driven hmm. by this, but it seems like a lot of the pros and cons of this are, it seems like the, the busing thing seems to have an inordinate, an inordinate amount of influence on this. And hmm. if the total cost of busing is something like a million dollars, that's a very tiny percentage of the community's investment in education on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. uh, we're talking a couple of percent, less than 5%. I'm assuming the differences between the most elaborate, expensive busing we could imagine and the status quo, what is that, maybe 150% 100, 100%? 187,000 if we were to just move the high school, right. So that's a fraction of a percent of the total mm -hmm. annual investment in education we're talking about. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, it seems to me, and I, and I don't mean this to sound I don't know, condescending or something, but it seems to me like as a community, we need to decide what is the right model for the educational model. So mm -hmm. what is the best time to have these different age kids at school to maximize their educational productivity? Mm -hmm. Personally, I don't think athletics or very minor cost differentials, two, three percent of our annual spending on education mm -hmm. should even be discussed until we decide what we want to do because it's right. And when we as a community mm -hmm. decide what we want to do because it's right, as long as there's sort of a clear majority opinion on that, then we figure out how to make that happen. And if it raises our transportation costs mm -hmm. two, 3%, then that's what we do because it's mm -hmm. right. And mm -hmm. I, I just, I can't, I, I find it kind of crazy that we, we're spending all this energy talking about busing when it's, I understand it is a, it's part of our lives, but the busing 
will follow what we decide is right. And, and in a couple of years, you know, that will totally seem normal because that, you know, the busing will accommodate the school schedule that we all decide we want. So that's just my two cents on the whole, mm -hmm. you know, these external things like athletics and busing, mm -hmm. which just don't seem to me like they should be a very big driver on this, personally. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I'd like just to take a moment to respond to that because it seems so simple. Uh, and uh, to many people, it, it does seem that simple that, you know, for the most expensive plan at $187,000, if we value the high school starting later, we should make the decision to do that and put $187,000 into our annual budget and make it work. However, right now we're working on developing our budget for next year and we have a $550,000 gap that we're trying to cover. Uh, in order to get there, we've had to lay off and cut jobs, uh, partial jobs or full jobs of about 15 people. That results in cutting programs and services to students. Um, specifically, you know, one example is we can't offer a world language in sixth grade anymore. Uh, so what you're saying certainly seems like a small amount of money, and I would agree. But if we added it to our budget right now, instead of being $550,000 short, we would be $740,000 short. And so we would have to cut an additional $187,000, which would have the result of another five to 10 jobs and therefore services to our kids in school. Okay. Hi, um, I'm a current junior at Northampton High School, and I'd like to say that um, I've never really heard people complaining about um, starting school too early, but I have heard people complaining that their classes are too big or they don't get to do things because we're understaffed. So it greatly concerns me that um, this kind of an issue would cost us money that might cut teachers or programs that we could use that would be, I think, much more valuable to our education than an extra hour of sleep. And I think that only if we extended school by an hour would it be beneficial. Um, but extending school by an hour cuts greatly into after-school programs. And as a participant in several clubs and athletics, I can say I'm up pretty late as it is, and I don't want to be up for an extra two hours. That's all I have to say. Yeah, I'm curious about why... Um why the hub bus proposal costs more. I mean, we're, it's the same number of Durham buses, and, um, and, it, and it, we wouldn't be using the hub proposal, although I don't know why not, for the vans. So they'll be doing exactly what they're doing right now, which is running three separate routes. Or do we have to get more vans because they're running at the same time? Why, why do the vans cost more than they currently cost? Okay. Uh, our director of transportation, Joy Winnie, has joined us. And though I try very hard not to put her on the spot, I'm afraid I can't answer your question without getting some input from Joy on why there's an increase with the hub busing program. And I know she has the answer for you. The increase would be in the morning hub proposal. We would need 11 vans as opposed to the five. Our elementary vans right now are totally loaded. Um, so we would not be able to utilize them. And as you know, they are door to door. Um, they are driven by the individual education plans by the students. Um, so I run the fine line between um, who I can put with each other on the vans a lot of times. Uh, and with that being said, uh, you're basically doubling up the specialized transportation in the morning. So that's where the cost is going to come in, is for the vans in the morning. In the afternoon, my proposal is a little bit different than yours. It's to keep the three tiers, to keep the costs down, which we can do um, because of the, yeah, exactly. But in the morning, I won't be able to do that because we're basically doubling up the high school and the elementary kids onto the vans. And the vans are limited in seating. I can only put um, six elementary students on the van. I can't put anybody in the front seat. Um, sometimes if it's the bigger van, I can put seven on. Eight with the driver is the legal maximum for the students on the vans. Yeah. 
So the yeah. question was that on the out of district buses, we put elementary students and high school students on the same bus. I want to make sure people at home can well, hear it too. Not, and so, Joy, your response was? It's, if, if the program has the combined elementary with the high school students in the program that we're sending the students to for out of district, I think we maybe have two out of district programs that do that. The rest divide uh, the students by their grades and ages. But yeah, and, and, and uh, the district students, um, basically the out of district schools kind of handle the behavioral issues that come up on those buses, um, just as they would in the classroom with those students. Thank you. This gentleman up front's been waiting patiently to say a few words. I'll try to say just a few words. Uh, my name is Mark Horowitz. Uh, my girls are in 11th and 9th grade. My son's in 5th grade. The decision will affect our family uh, every day for the next seven years. Um, and, you know, my concern about the conversation on busing, which needs to happen in terms of costs, is there's so much focus on the busing conversation that it's as if we all agree that but for the busing, the start time should change. And um, I, like the superintendent, I have no questions about the sleep research. Um, I think we're confusing passion and science here in a way that's not helpful. I totally respect that a lot of people feel like it would help some kids to come to school later. Um, there's two leaps we're making in science that I think are a little broad. From all the, and I haven't read all the research, but I've probably read half a dozen of the articles. The notion that in some communities an hour and a half has made a difference in some factors doesn't at all speak to what a half hour would make. It's, it's quite a leap to think it would make a difference. But last night I was reading some of the Minnesota studies and what, what they sort of supported, which is my idea, is that what late start time really affects is if you have an enormous tardiness or absentee policy. Because I think what happens is that if a community has a really serious absentee policy, uh, problem, sorry, that when you make the start time an hour and a half later, the fact is more kids get to school. And the reason some of the test scores get better is because the kids are in school. This is not to diss this, the, the, the research on the brain, but we're way from the point research-wise where we can really make links between these observations and a school outcome question that's got so many variables. And so I think that if we're having a serious problem with absenteeism and, and tardy, and we're trying to get kids to school, I still think there's other ways to work with families to get kids to school. Uh, my concern is that if it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And that while I know people have been advocating for this for nine years, I, I think it's great that you're doing this survey. Um, I'm concerned that in nine years, there hasn't been a real attempt to ask families. You know, one of the things I, I wrote in the Gazette about a while ago that I think about a lot, and I do social science work, is uh, Alessandra used the word unintended consequences. There's like, there's like a dozen of these things. There's a lot of things that are going to fall out of place in terms of families, in terms of kid access to teachers out of school that are very concrete and predictable. And this notion that being more rested in the morning is going to compensate for that is, um, I think it's a leap. And so I'm just concerned that we're having too much conversation about how can we afford to do the right thing. And I'm not at all convinced that cost benefit wise that this is um, the right thing. I also have to say I really appreciate the conversation tonight, the opportunity, and the tone thus far has been really respectful and civil, and it, 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 it really hasn't been uh, in a lot of forums, and I think we've got to find a way to be able to listen to the kids, to listen to parents, and to just have disagreements about this. Thank you. There are three hands up from people who have spoken. Is there anyone who hasn't spoken who would like to make sure they get their opinion shared before we uh, go on to those three hands? Um, 
I would just like to add that um, among many other sports, um, the girls indoor track team is the second best team in the state and it is a huge sport. It's one of the biggest sports teams at the high school. And th for the past five years, I spoke with a coach and a teacher um, and who's a coach and a teacher. And for the past um, five years, we have that facility from 2.30 until 4.30 and 2.30 until 4, um, depending on the day of the week. And Smith cannot give it to us any later. And I think that's important to think about the fact that we would not have that facility at all if um, we changed the start time because we would have, what, 20 minutes of practice. And I think there are a lot of great athletes, but I think it's also we have a really great resource that a lot of schools don't have. Thank you, and congratulations on being second in the state. That's pretty impressive. Okay. I'm just going to add, I've only been in the district for a couple of years, but if you haven't taken a, a vote, because again, people who tend to come to meetings are usually very opinionated in one way or the other, but if you haven't taken a vote of either the, the high schoolers or the parents or both, Take a vote and let that be a deciding factor in whether we push ahead and decide to find a way to do this. And the other thought that I had was, um, I know that a lot of parents whose kids go to Hilltown put their kids on a PBTA bus, and I wonder if some high school kids mm -hmm. could take a PBTA bus home. Uh, if I, I want to comment on that quickly, because you raise a very important point, which is what we're planning to do. Uh, we have put together a survey, not necessarily a vote, but a survey to get the pulse of the community which uh, includes the four options that I've outlined before. And uh, if I could just get some information from my executive assistant, is this survey gonna be sent to each home? Is it electronic or paper? How are we doing this? A paper copy. A paper, yeah, I wanna take the microphone. <laughs> just so at home they can hear. We're gonna do paper copies that will be handed out um, to all faculty and staff at all six schools. It will also be handed out to the high school and JFK students, um, paper copies, which will be handed out and then handed back immediately, probably in first period. And then we'll be doing home mailings for all of the parents to all of the community members. Um, and it will also be available online, so if there are community members that want to access that, they can have the information. It's what Brian presented. Great, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Renee Wetstein, and um, I want to address March 6, 2008 was when the first time we actually organized a lot of parents and students and we actually wrote a letter to the superintendent of schools and the school committee and the school council at Northampton High School. We wrote, we the parents and guardians of students or prospective students at Northampton High School and members of the Northampton community are strongly in favor of moving the start time to Northampton High School from its current 7.30 a.m. to 8.30 or even later, shifting the time to the end of the school day. We support this change because studies have consistently shown that it's detrimental to teenagers to have to wake up so early in the morning. Teenagers need between nine and 10 hours of sleep a night. U.S. teens currently average seven and a half hours. Lack of sleep is linked to everything from depression to illness, injury, car and other accidents, stunted growth, obesity, and negative effect on ability. Now what's interesting, Mark Horowitz and Julia Har uh, Moss signed this petition in 2008. So, you know, Mark, I don't want to out you now, but it feels like <laughs> too late. <laughs> um, it, it is interesting. I'd love to have a discussion with you later. What happened to your thinking since 2008? Mm -hmm. But um, regarding surveys, we have surveys. I have surveys here that mm -hmm. went out to every single parent to the Northampton High School students. Mm -hmm. um, we have these, this stuff is done already. We mm -hmm. had surveys in the school, over 800 students did this monkey survey, and it was created by a student. So you are gonna have students that are against this, you're gonna have students that are in favor of this. Mm -hmm. um, no one's speaking for the students that are de depressed, that I know a child right now who's not gonna graduate this year because he does not have enough credits, because he cannot get his, his you know, <laughs> to get to school. And he, mm -hmm. this kid is over six feet tall, boys grow at night, girls grow too, um, and these kids are growing. If you, if you were living with a teenager, you see these children growing. These children are driving vehicles when they turn 16 and a half. They are sleep deprived. So not just for those children, they could hit you. <laughs> you know, so this is not just, science I think is incredible on this, but just being a mother and seeing and talking to other parents, um, you know, so we've done this already. So Mark, you know, I would love to have a meeting with you afterwards and um, 
to show you what has all the work that has been done and the surveys. But I think it also needs leadership because Amherst, if they do it and they start at nine o'clock in the morning, we compete with Amherst in so many different realms. Um, I think that's something we need to consider as a community, how they got it through, if they do, in one year. And I haven't been involved in this for nine years, but I've been involved in this for five years. And the school committee has agreed on the research, you know, that discussion is over with. Mm. It's how do we get it done? And, you know, I love that new people are coming in and saying, well, it's not a lot of money. And I've been frustrated in this struggle because I feel mm. like we never have these discussions where really smart people in this community can figure out are there other ways to do it. And it seems like it's always an administration that mm. blocks discussions and creative ideas, even from students. Students have also wanted to think about ideas because they ride the buses. So I think that it is bus driven and I think there has to be a solution. This is not solving cancer. This is just getting kids to school. Thank you. Hi. Um, well, I just wanted, um, I'm Sarah Mosser, it's kind of awkward, my dad just talked. Um, but I just wanted to point out first that um, just uh, that my parents would sign the survey does bring into light the fact that many parents, you want to design the survey to make sure that people really know what they're signing off of clearly. Um, the second thing, um, so, all right, so first um, on the Amherst issue, I know a lot of people from Amherst and I know that it's just as controversial there that it is here. It is definitely not a set in stone issue. There's people who are just as, or who are really frustrated because it's, it's not really that great of a situation there either. Um, so as a student, I, I just wanted to be recognized that this is really a local issue. This is, a, this is an issue of changing the school start, start time. It's not an issue of activism and making our community better in a huge, huge way. This is, this is one small thing. Um, and I think that a lot of drama has kind of gotten into all these discussions um, and it's become kind of a really emotional battle when it's, it really should be something that should be talked about really logically. Um, and also, there's a lot of people who have been putting out ideas about why can't we just fix the bus busing? Why isn't it just a really simple fix? Um, and as you, as, um, as you said, there's, there's laws and there's, there's regulations. You can't just kind of make something completely new up because that's just, it's just not how it works and we can appeal to the state or something, but that's just not really how it works. Um, so we can't, we can't completely get rid of every single thing that's going on just for this issue. Um, and I, I, I do still, I believe that everyone who's here today um, does care about doing what's best for students. And I completely respect that, that you would come out and talk about, um, uh, to try to help your kids. But I, I just, I think people need to recognize that as students, this, this isn't an issue that is on our minds in the same way as, you know, as, the future of cutting our arts or cutting teachers and we're, we're really worried about those kinds of things and we're not as worried about this. Thank you. Um, I'm Stephen Michael. I'm a junior at the high school. Um, for one thing, there was a comment that administration often blocks discussion, but that's why we're here tonight. Um, just like to point that out. Uh, the other thing is that I think that the early start time is not the cause of problems necessarily, although it does perhaps cause problems, but it's the result of some deeper problems, um, namely the workload, not just at the high school, and, and the culture around it. There, in the life of a high schooler, um, there's a lot of pressure to look good for colleges. You want to take harder courses and do well in them. You want to do sports. But you also want to have a social life, have things to write about on your college essays. And um, with all these pressures, it's very easy to get sucked into doing everything. Um, that's what's happened to me <laughs> over the past couple of years. And when you have all these commitments, that takes away from the time in your day, which then takes away from the amount of sleep you get and it's not the um, problem of having the high school early, but just the problem of having so much work. Uh, when I was in ninth grade, I didn't have very many hard classes, partially because in ninth grade there's not that many options for you. Um, however, as I, and, and my grades were very good then, 
as I've progressed into this year, I've had a lot more options. I'm taking seven credits worth of AP. Don't do it. Um, <laughs> and by doing that, I've also really increased the workload that I have, which has caused me to get less sleep. And I do think that's related to my grades <laughs> declining slightly in my classes. And I'd just like to put out there that I think that's the underlying cause of the problems that we're seeing and not necessarily the early start time. In ninth grade, I was doing fine with an early start time. Thank you. Thank you. Suzanne Strauss again. OK, um, a few things that I just wanted to address. One is um, the students that are here today are very good students, very strong students. And one of the things that you, superintendent, actually said in a, in a I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I don't want to quote you, but was that we need to deal with attendance and tardy issues. It is a real issue at Northampton High School and that we also need to um, make sure that we're dealing with the students who don't have some of the access that some of the kids in this room have. And I think for those kids, it makes a huge difference. There are kids who are parenting their little brother and sisters in the morning and in the afternoons and all kinds of things. So I think that the issue of sort of the gap of education is probably, with somebody like Stephen, is really, we're not going to see it. If Stephen goes to school at 6.30 in the morning, it's probably not going to change his GPA very much, and probably for most of the kids in this room. But I think it does make a difference to the kid who is having a hard time getting to school for whatever reason, and we have lots of them. And we have a, stu we have a, a school that's in a great transition, actually, in terms of, and, and, and a widening gap that I've seen in the years that I've been in Northampton High School about what kids need and what we can provide and who needs more help and who needs more after school stuff and who needs everything, you know, and we just, I agree, we, we don't have the money for what we want to have in our school. But that being said, um, I think that uh, there, it's true that a late start time is not going to answer all the problems for our school. But what I hear a lot of is how it's going to be negative. And what we, ne we don't know, the thing is there will always be unintended consequences for whatever we do, whatever that thing is. But we are a system that in the high school has not changed in 14 years. You would be hard pressed to find any organization that that does not happen. People change, things change. You know, we're trying to run a school in the same way when we didn't even have the internet 14 years ago in our school. And I think what we need to do is take a broader approach. I mean, Stephen went to, uh, to Norway last, it was last year, right? Their school, and so, did, and so did Heather. They were both in my class at that time, right? And whoever, I don't know whoever else is here. But, what we're, but the thing is, is they operate a school where you go later. Sometimes they actually leave early. They have like a three, they go to school for three or four hours. They have a much more open situation. And we're doing stuff in a way that seems to me to be sort of very closed and very contained and very much like we know, we know the poison that we're taking and we're, we're okay taking it. Instead of saying, there maybe it would be positive. Yeah, there would be unintended consequences, and maybe the consequences that we would have would be far-reachingly, vastly better. And that's something that I think we need to consider. What would be better? You know, and we're all thinking about, oh, I'm going to go to bed later. Probably not. Probably not. So anyway, I think that we need to look at it as what would we gain, not always what we would lose? And I think that that's not a part of the discussion that we're having. I don't want to respond to every speaker, but Suzanne, I can't let some of what you said lie without response. Uh, we do not have an attendance or a tardy issue at the high school, and I never said that. Uh, what I said when I spoke about attendance 
is that it's something we want to pay attention to because district wide we have 95.3 percent attendance rate which is very good and we all know that the more kids are in school the more they're going to learn mm -hmm. and so my challenge to the district was to try to raise that even one percent that because our attendance rate is 95.3 percent and it's very good it's easy to ignore it's easy to say, that's great, let's focus on other things. And I believe that school attendance is so important that if it's 95%, there's no reason we shouldn't try for 96%. So I think it's important that I challenge that point, <laughs> since you were quoting me. Uh, second, you made a comment that the high school hasn't changed in 14 years, and I can't believe Principal Nancy Athens is still in her seat behind you, uh, because I've only been here since August, and I know that you've just initiated a brand new advisory program. They've added new courses and new programs and technology, as you mentioned, over the past 14 years. You've changed the long block. The high school has evolved tremendously in the last 14 years. And it only takes a simple MIMSI report to show your AP involvement with uh, students and the diversity of students who have been taking AP courses and scoring off the charts from students taking 150 AP tests seven years ago to 748 AP tests this year. Unbelievable. I would say that the third point I want to challenge, the poison you're taking, is more like a vitamin. And the kids are doing fantastic, and I don't want to change a thing. Thank you. I've got the mic, so I'm going to use it. Uh, my name is Gina Norton-Smith, and I have a ninth grader at Northampton High, and I have a sixth grader at the high, uh, junior high. Um, when we bought our house, we bought our house at a place where my kids could get to school easily and quickly. So I live just around the corner. My, my, only my sixth grader takes the bus, and next year he's going to bike to school. My high schooler walks to school, so he can leave the house at 725 and get to school on time. He's fast. <laughs> um, <laughs> for the, for the, so busing really isn't my issue. Um, for my family. But I look at this chart that, we, that you gave us at Proposal 3, and I had no idea that the earliest bus route start time was 6.35 a.m., and I think that's obscene. I don't know about the starting school at 7.30, but I know having to get a kid someplace with all the stuff that they need to do, having to feed them breakfast, and have them upright and standing out of traffic, wherever that might be for the bus stop, at 6.30 a.m. is obscene. It just really is. Um, the other thing is uh, having a start time later in the day, whatever that magic number is, that magic time is, um, that also relieves, the, that would also relieve the pressure on students to fall, try and fall asleep earlier. So yeah, I think that's part of the point. It's not, you would, you would push everything later, but you would push it later into a time period where the teenagers naturally do things. I have a teenager who is as involved as anybody you're gonna find in the room, and who is as good a student as anybody you're gonna find in this room, and he is dedicated to getting his sleep. And so at 9.30 at night, he's got all his stuff done, packed his lunch, has his clothes ready to go, and he can't fall asleep. He's trying and trying and trying, and he can't fall asleep. And it bothers him to no end. If he had more time in the evening, he would feel, get out of that pressure to fall asleep, because he's dedicated to his rest, and he's dedicated to his work and to his after-school activities, and that would make less pressure on him um, just in terms of taking care of his bodily needs. Hi, I'm Sharon Castelli. I have a, a seventh grader and a tenth grader. And same thing, my kids just can't fall asleep early at night. It just doesn't happen. Now that my son is in, once he became in sixth grade, it's like our struggle every night to get them to sleep. And in the morning, they're exhausted. And every day, my daughter's like a minute late to the high school. And my son, it's just, it's just so, it's like one of the biggest problems. 
So that's my main thing. And it, if, if, it, if it was a later start time, they'd still go to bed the same time. It wouldn't go later. It, I don't think their body clocks are really able. Uh, and I give them um, natural plant oils every night to relax their <laughs> nervous systems because I do aromatherapy. It, it, it's just not happening. Um, and I, I really feel like they are sleep deprived because of 7.30. That, I just can't believe it. it's so early. And uh, even, you know, 7.55, it, it's just to get up and get there in time. That's my issue. All right, I, I know I'm butting in, so I'll keep it brief. I'm not going to say everything. First of all, I think with tardies, uh, this isn't quite related, but you mentioned that your kid is getting there one minute late. I think it would be nice if we could change the tardy policy so that there's a, di <laughs> so that there's a difference between being five minutes late and being... 80 minutes late because mm -hmm. I know at least one student who's in my class when he knows he's going to be a couple minutes late it's like oh no difference coming a half an hour late I'll relax and get there a little later and I think that kids who are one minute late when they miss the announcements maybe shouldn't be penalized so much and that shouldn't be as big of a deal uh, the second thing is that in regard to not being able to get to sleep um, from my experience and the experience of my little brother, there is a, who's at the elementary school now, he's in fifth grade, there's a culture at the elementary schools of going to bed later is cool. I went to bed at 10 o'clock. Well, oh yeah, well I went to bed at 10.30. And they can do that because their school starts at 8.55. They don't have to be on the bus until 7.45. They can go to bed at 10 o'clock and if they're driven, they can get up at 8, get 10 hours of sleep, and be there on time. And so they're doing that. Uh, my little brother has recently started going to bed later. But when they hit the uh, middle school and then the high school, they can't do that anymore. And after so many years of being used to doing that, it's hard to change. And I think that's part of where the problem is. Maybe we could put some sleep education into our elementary schools or things like that. Um, to try to correct these at an earlier age. Anyway, I will pass the mic. Thank you. Just a reminder, we will go until 8.30, so there's 20 more minutes to get your comments in, and we will close the conversation at precisely 8.30. Thank you. Hi, Steve. Hello there. Um, my name is <clears throat> Steve Harrell, and uh, I suppose I'm one of the ones who's been passionate about this, so I will try to withhold my passion and speak directly to the issues. Um, I have a daughter who graduated from Northampton High School in 2006, and she was on the crew, and she was in all the musicals, and she was stage manager for The Wizard of Oz, so she was <clears throat> very active and a very good student. Um, she wrote a paper for the uh, Devil's Advocate, the student newspaper at that time, which I don't think is in existence anymore, about the issue of the 7.30 start time. And it was then that I first became involved in this issue, back in about 2005. I spoke a couple of times at the school committee meetings, and then Superintendent Isabelina Rodriguez formed a ad hoc committee to study the issue, and she asked me to be on it. I accepted gladly. There were administrators and teachers and the athletic director and so forth on the committee as well. After some months of meeting and study, we submitted a written formal recommendation to the school committee and the superintendent that said that the school start time of the high school should be moved to 8.30. The school committee did not act on that, nor did the superintendent. Uh, so that's just a little bit of history I wanted to tell you uh, why I feel uh, somewhat passionate. Um, also, I'm the owner of a downtown ice cream parlor, and over the last 30 years, <laughs> I have employed over 600 youngsters, many of them North Hampton High School students. So this topic I'm very familiar with um, in a number of ways. So just to get to a few of the um, points made tonight, I agree very much with this man behind me who spoke earlier uh, that this is an educational decision. And we saw all of this discussion about buses and 
some costs and routes and activities and so forth uh, need to fall in place after the decision that this is what we need to do. Uh, the, uh, there is, as far as $187,000 or $100,000 or no dollars, whatever, uh, there is uh, a comment from a parent in Amherst who said at one of their forums and meetings that when you consider all the money we spend on trying to make educational improvements and educational programs, that even if it was $187,000, that would be a bargain to what it can provide in benefits to our students in our community. Uh, there's also some talk of an override that's get right down to the nitty gritty uh, that would increase the income of the city and for the school department. And again, uh, a few hundred thousand dollars out of $28 million does not sound like a lot. So I think we need to remember that. Um, as far as Amherst, no. First, I want to tell you quickly, uh, just a side point, uh, about the question of uh, grade school, elementary school students and high schoolers on the same bus. Uh, there are some who have objected to that idea. However, there is a uh, school district in Michigan, Bridgman, Michigan, and last September, uh, they began a plan of having the high school and the middle school and the grade school, uh, I'm sorry, elementary school students on the same buses, uh, mainly to save money. But there was an article in their area paper and uh, the superintendent of schools there, Superintendent Shane Peters, uh, was quoted in the article a number of times. Uh, he said it was a transportation, transportation arrangement that is used in many districts in the West, Midwest, and that once the district makes the transition, the system works 99.9% .9 of the time. He went on to say that the elementary students are their assigned seats, and the high schoolers sit in between the uh, middle schoolers and the grade and the elementary students, and uh, they act as a buffer. And he also said, um, high school students become role models for the younger kids demonstrating safety precautions and so on and so forth. Uh, I thought that was very interesting, and, uh, but it was some months ago, so I was brazen enough to pick up the phone and to see if I could talk with the superintendent, uh, some random parent from halfway across the country, uh, but he was gracious enough and took my call and uh, said, how's the, how's the plan going? He said, it's just going great. There have been no problems. No complaints from the bus drivers, no complaints to the uh, to his office, no complaints to the principals. So I think that that's something that we should uh, consider. Uh, but again, that's kind of a small point. Um, I do want to tell you that in Amherst, they are very likely to go ahead and pass a plan for a later start time. They're probably going to vote on it next week. Uh, I've attended some of their school committee meetings. There is one gentleman who is opposed to it, but almost all of the others are in favor of it. This plan will go, would go into effect in September uh, 2013. Uh, Maria Garrett, their superintendent, is very much in favor of it. So <clears throat> that's likely to happen. Their athletic, athletic director uh, feels that it will not be a problem for sports and that he thinks that he can get, as far as start times of games with other schools, he thinks he can get an exemption or exemptions from the league that both Northampton and Amherst are in to uh, arrange the start time of the games so that they would uh, not be a problem. Um, there are some on our own school committee who think that that would be a problem and there would never be any exemptions, but so that question remains open. Um, now to the question of uh, and I, I'll try to be brief, um, of the question of seating required to be provided on the buses. There is a feeling uh, that among the school, some school committee members that um, we are required, and I think Mr. Salzer mentioned that tonight, to actually require seats on the buses for everyone who has bought a pass or has been given a pass due to need. Uh, I have looked for this law and regulation, both uh, local and state level and national level, 
and I have not found it. Uh, other people have also looked for this uh, regulation of law, and we have not found it. And the, uh, <coughs> the regulations and laws that uh, are listed in the handout tonight do not address this particular point. They address points about drivers and seat sizes and capacity of buses and so forth. So that is a serious question that really needs to uh, be answered. Is there such a law or regulation or not? And I bring that up because on the buses that arrive at North Anthem High School in the morning, uh, probably some of you know that several of his parents took a survey one morning, and there are nine buses that arrived, and uh, these buses have a capacity of 78. The bus with the most students on it was 24, and one bus had 11, one had nine, one, another one had nine, one had 14, and one had one student getting off a bus with a capacity of 35 seats. 35 seats. So the question of the number of bus passes um, and the number of seats that we're driving these big buses around with uh, really needs to be more carefully examined, in my opinion, in my humble opinion. <laughs> um, just one more point or two. Um, this lady back here asked if we had had surveys or votes. Uh, Yes, we certainly have. Uh, I'll be glad to provide copies of some of those to you if you would like. I'll just draw attention to one or two of them. Um, there was a survey done of Northampton High School students uh, in 2009, and there was a very high response rate, and about two-thirds of them do favor a later start time. And I think more interesting than that, 53% uh, said that they fall asleep in class often or sometimes. That's a lot of students falling asleep in class. So I don't know how they can learn, learn something if they're falling asleep. Um, <clears throat> there was a, no, I think I'll just skip over that part. Um, I'm just about done. Uh, so, oh yes, two last points. Uh, one is that I know it seems like if you don't have to get up as early, you'll stay up later. Uh, did I say that backwards? I think no. so. No. Um, and I respect your views and opinion on that. It certainly seems to make sense. However, in school districts across the country that have made this change to a later high school start time, that has not been borne out. That is not what the evidence says. They, in fact, do not stay up later. But they go to bed pretty much when their circadian rhythm tells them they, they, they can and go to sleep. So that really is not... Uh, with all due respect, does not happen. Um, I know we've talked about that before, but it seems to be we need to repeat it. And then the last thing is that um, I know it sounds like if the day ends later, you're going to have less time for extracurricular activities. Um, I went to a high school in outside of Washington, D.C. in Montgomery County, Maryland, a large high school with uh, 2,000 students in it, and uh, it began at 9 o'clock, and it got out at 3.30. And I, I assure you, we have a full roster of all sports, uh, lots of competitions and games, all kinds of musical uh, programs, and bands and orchestra and clubs, and the whole nine yards. And uh, my big shtick was the band. It was a big band, a marching band, and then a concert band. and. Uh, had a great time, but it took a lot of time on weekends and practices and so forth. At any rate, the point I'm trying to make is that with a shift in the start time, at, uh, after school activities and extracurricular activities, in fact, can go on at full strength. Uh, there's a shift in the day, and uh, I don't think you need to be so concerned about that. Uh, I suggest that to you in a humble way. So that's what I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Just a reminder, we will wrap up in about seven minutes. Um, but before we do, I want to make sure that we acknowledge that uh, this is a listening session, which I think has been fantastic. I'm glad so many people are sharing. So I am taking in your thoughts, opinions, and questions. I also pointed out at the beginning, our Vice Chair Stephanie Pick is here, listening to you as well, and also School Committee Member Howard Moore is here. Uh, so uh, I think it's important that you have the opportunity to be heard and that we can have this kind of public discussion. Thank you. 
Um, my name is Gwen Agna. I'm the principal of Jackson Street School. Um, I've been principal here 16 years, and I've been a parent in the system since 1984. My, both my kids went through our schools and our functional human beings, um, which is testament to our schools, I think, not to our parenting necessarily. And I, I am a really concerned citizen. We still live in town. Our girls are, are way past any of that, but um, I'm concerned as a, a professional and a citizen that we have a really big problem in Northampton. We don't have enough money for schools. And I, in the years that I've been principal, we've been cutting our budgets every year. I think there was one year that we didn't have to cut. Um, this morning we spent an hour and a half together, the elementary principals, trying to cut $100,000. And that was an exercise in real depression and discouragement about where we are in education in our, our community and in our country, basically. Um, I used to be the early childhood coordinator and I spent a lot of time writing grants and I know when we talk about Amherst as sort of our, our competitive partner across the river, they have a very different funding scheme in their city and the, actually not a city, it's a town. We're a small city, they're a town and they have a high free and reduced lunch eligibility because they have 40,000 students there. We don't have the same kind of funding here. And when we got our education reform designation, we were 36th city out of 36 cities in Massachusetts. So I think our, our problem is we don't have enough money from our city. And the superintendent made a, a big effort this year to try to get the city to give us more. They have ended up giving us a little more. We have a big problem with charter schools and the fact that the funding is such that we lose money. And we have a big tax problem in this, in this state. So that I, I, I'm concerned that we get derailed by certain issues that definitely do have to do with education and the right ways that we need to be for our kids. But I also am very concerned at this point as Brian said earlier, that if that there really is a huge cost to doing something like this, it, it, it probably is the best thing to do for kids, but compared to also losing teachers, which really would be the trade-off right now, unless we can figure out a, a way to ask our voters to do another override, or really, really put our efforts in changing and doing tax reform and charter school reimbursement reform, I think we really are going to be in a situation where it's going to be scrambling for the scraps. And I, I hate the idea that I might see that as part of my legacy in this town as an as a educator. We have so many good schools and so many committed people working in them. Um, I, I hope we can come to some consensus about supporting schools generally and then finding a way to, to do what's right for all of our kids with the right amount of money that we should have. Thank you very much. We will take one more comment. That's right. Uh, one more comment. It's the final comment for tonight. It's not the final comment. Uh, so we will wrap up after this comment and we will hold another community forum in July and a fourth one in August before I take my proposals and recommendations to the school committee in September. All right, Greg, thank you. So I'm Greg Kerstetter, and I teach fifth grade here in town. And I came here hoping to, or thinking that I might be persuaded to support a late start. Um, and I just haven't been supported, or haven't been persuaded at all. Um, and I just want to um, thank Gwen for that. Um, it's just a nice reminder that uh, this proposal has costs, and we are uh, at elementary schools. Um, I think we are already teaching the scraps. <laughs> that's the way. It, that's the way it feels. Um, and I, I guess we went to voters and, and said, um, "Could we have more money?" So partially, could we have kids start later? I couldn't imagine a quicker defeat ever. Um, just that's just a non-seller right away. Um, and I guess the last thing. Uh, I always, 
I'm just wondering why um, an issue that is with that has to do with half of our students drives this whole thing that affects all of our students. And it's uh, I feel like it's a high school issue, and it's and it's so true that um, all of our students do go through the high school, but um, just don't know that we're really thinking enough about elementary schools and. Um, well, thank you very much. Thank you, Greg, and thank you everybody for coming tonight. I really appreciate it. We'll see you next time.